but I want to thank everyone for spending time with us um, on a Friday afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Chan. I am the department chair of clinical pharmacy practice at the University of California Irvine School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Um, I want to thank all of you for accepting my invite to join this uh, webinar on Friday. Um, I will be your host for today's event. And we've put together a great program that I think you all will be enjoying it um, and finding that the time is well spent. Uh, first of all, we'll be recording the session. So you will see that there's a Zoom button popping out um, asking for your authorization. So thank you for clicking that and giving us that, that consent. Um, just a very quick introduction about us at UCI School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Uh, we were formed just slightly less than a year ago, but we're making great progress in terms of building our school and also our upcoming PharmD program. But more importantly, as a school, we are very committed to make a difference in advancing the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, for our school, for UCI, and also for our communities. Um, so, you know, I think as a new school, we also see that there's a very important role that we need to play to combat health disparities within pharmacy practice. Um, and, you know, with the pandemic and the backdrop, we are getting to see that this is getting more and more important that we need to be aware of these health equity issues and think about how to, you know, come up with solutions and, you know, to better serve our community. So, which is why the Department of Clinical Pharmacy Practice is seeing that this is a great timing for us to run our very first health disparity webinar. You know, unfortunately, this is going to be, this is virtual, but hopefully in future that we can have some face to face interaction. Um, so today's webinar, we have these sort of objectives um, and the main goal is really to get everyone sort of understand about what are some of these health disparity issues through case studies. Um, and then, of course, to understand what exactly are the barriers facilitators of overcome of implementing um, health services to overcome these health disparities in the community. Um, and hopefully we can all come together, you know, put our brains together to think about whether or not that there are innovative solutions to overcome some of these problems that we are observing. And we got some really great um, speaker lineup for today. Um, so after this introduction, we'll have Dean Hirsch who talked a little bit about uh, our health disparity, uh, our diversity and as well as Black Thriving Initiative at UCI. And then we've, we'll have our speakers giving our case studies um, related to what they see in their own settings. And then we'll have some time where we can do some breakout, some discussion, as well as you know, sharing from each of the breakout room as well. So hopefully we'll be able to you know, come up with some synergy, come up with some solutions for what we're seeing. Um, and this is really just one of the very first webinar that we'll be running um, related health disparity. So hopefully, you know, we'll be able to figure out how to move forward from here. So with this said, um, I'm going to move forward for our first speaker for this event. I'm going to introduce to all of you Dean Jen Hirsch. Um, Dean Hirsch is currently our Dean for the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences here at University of California, Irvine. She will be introducing to all of you about the UCI Diversity and Black Thriving Initiative. Dean Hirsch. So. I unmute myself. Thank you, Chair Chan. It sounds so good, Chair Chan. <laughs> um, next slide. So, what, what I wanted to do just for, for for those of you that are not from UC Irvine, and for everyone that is um, from UC Irvine, I think this is kind of interesting for us to think about the environment that we're in. And we, at the pharmacy practice, including myself, we're pretty new to um, UC Irvine. Um, it in UC Irvine has had a strong commitment and success to diversity, which is driving some of our interest and some of our hiring for some of the people that are looking into researching health equity and how can, how we can best um, address diversity. So I just got like three slides to kind of give you some background from the greater campus level. Um, we are a Hispanic serving institution. We were designated that in 2017. We're also a um, Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institution. Um, we're very proud um, that people recognize this and the campus has been doing so much work in this area. In 2021, uh, Wall Street Journal Times Higher Education Rankings, we were ranked number two 
in the nation for diversity. That's, that says so much uh, about UCI and the effort that has gone in um, to making our entire campus, whether it's students, faculty, um, and staff, more diverse. We have a long way to go, but there's so much work that has been done here long before I got here and a number of our, our faculty even got here. Our freshman profile is we are um, over 50% um, first generation um, students giving those opportunities there, um, and there are lots of challenges there. Um, and we're about 26% underrepresented um, minorities. Again, these are good. We're beginning accolades for these, but the, these can be improved upon. Next slide. And at the, at the campus level, there is, we have an Office of Inclusive Excellence. So I just want to set the stage of the environment we are working in. And this Office of Inclusive Excellence is, has three pillars, working on the community, thriving, and wellness. In the community, that is ensuring everyone, regardless of their function, contributes to a thriving and healthy campus. And the goals of this community pillar are to create a positive climate, promote belonging, combat intolerance, and honor free speech. Moving on to the second, the thriving um, pillar, this is fostering opportunities for everyone to maximize their potential at UCI. The goals being elevate minority thriving, educate and employ for diversity, advance equity, promote inclusion, and recognize diversity as a competency. It's not something you just check off and you learn about, but it's, it, we, it becomes a competency. We're trying to learn that. And then the last one, Tiller, is related to really what we're talking about today on wellness. That's part of our Office of Inclusive Excellence, promoting health and welfare of the campus, alumni and visitors. So that facilitating access, promote the thriving, create a health culture and lead collaborations. And I think the case study that we're going to hear about today and the work at least um, from, from the speakers fits in this wellness goal. It is we are trying to combat uh, lack of diversity, um, but we're also health professionals and we're promoting health equity. Um, and that's a little bit different. And that's sort of, I think these case, I'm looking forward to the case studies today to hearing about them. Next slide. And then Alex mentioned one particular initiative we have that this is a new initiative that's been going on for slightly more than a year. And I think it was catalyzed, it was somewhat in the works, but catalyzed certainly by the, um, the events of last year, um, the murder of George Floyd, Floyd and the follow-up to that. This is, a, this is a university approach. It's across our entire culture um, to build a whole university where Black people thrive. And there are three pillars to this, the anti-Blackness. This is really, we view this as an existential, existential threat to our mission. If you think about our mission as a university, it it anti-blackness negatively impacts the community and sense of belonging. It compromises our comp capacity to discover, innovate, and to serve and to heal. And those are our missions. And it really contradicts our role as a public university. You know, we're, we're here to serve all. It's a national imperative, therefore we must be in this together. Um, we're trying to leverage our role as a great public research in institute to dismantle anti-Black sentiment, that is an institutional imperative for us. And it just advanced the understanding of the Black experience and drivers of well-being. But then the, the bigger picture at the end of this on, this on the right is inclusive excellence. We're trying to accelerate our momentum in inclusive excellence through this program. And it, it builds on initiatives we already have that are inclusive action plan, um, we have a confronting extremism program. It fortifies our alignment with our UC Regents, which is our whole system, principles against intolerance that they have come out with. Um, and it harnesses our trends in the hiring of Black faculty and enrollment growth among Black undergraduates and graduate students. So this is a very specific initiative, uh, but overall it fits into the culture and the, and the evolving culture, really. We have a learning culture of of diversity. And, and that's what this, this whole webinar is about, trying to learn more and to problem solve. And the last thing I'll show you here is now down to our school level. Next slide, please. This is 
our school, uh, our new school, as Alex indicated, um, School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences here. We have a BS program, a PhD program, a master's program. I've highlighted the percent of underrepresented minority students, 19, 17, and 10% in those programs. Um, kind of good, kind of not so good. We've got a long way to go and, and we're working on this. We're also working on this with our faculty and our staff um, and trying to understand how, how can we become better at this. There, we, we do have a new PharmD class that's coming. It's not on here because they're not here yet. They start in September. That's their, our first PharmD class. So we've been, we've been um, recruiting very heavily on, and, and trying to increase the diversity of that class that's coming in also. So that we'll see how that turns out. So, so I just wanted to show you kind of the environment that we, or at least the faculty here at UCI are living in and the commitment, and it is a, it is a campus-wide commitment to helping to improve diversity and from the health side to improve health equity. And that's exactly what these cases are about today. And I, I hope we get to some really good problem solving and this continues on amongst our universities and amongst our, our researchers here. So thank you for the time for coming. Um, and I look forward to just participating. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Hirsch. Moving along, um, we're gonna have our first speaker sharing um, a case study, and we have our very own faculty, Dr. Cheryl Wizzo, who is uh, currently a health sciences assistant clinical professor at the Department of Clinical Pharmacy Practice at the School of Pharmacy here at UCI. Um, Cheryl will be sharing some of the great work that she's been doing, looking into social determinants of pharmacy deserts in Los Angeles County. All your Cheryl. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dr. Chan said, I'm Cheryl Wilson. I am an assistant health sciences assistant clinical professor at UCI. And through this work, I also have an appointment um, at um, Charles Audrey University of Medicine and Science. And I am a clinical scholar there as well. Next slide, please. So we'll be discussing the social determinants of um, pharmacy deserts. So exactly what are pharmacy deserts? Um, what does this concept mean? Um, the most um, well-known definition are those communities with no pharmacy within a one mile radius or communities with limited vehicle access and no pharmacy within a half mile radius. And this definition was adopted from the USDA and CDC definitions of food deserts. So while pharmacy deserts are not a new concept, our study was the first to identify and characterize the pharmacy deserts in California, more specifically in LA County. Next slide, please. So let's talk really briefly about the social determinants of health. Um, these are the conditions and environments in which people are born, where they live, work, play, worship, and age. They have these different domains as we see here by the um, infographic. They include the social and community context, economic stability, education, neighborhood and environment, so that built environment, and then healthcare and healthcare access. Um, they're real and immaterial or um, intangible resources that can affect the quality of life um, and health and wellness outcomes. And depending on which side of the tracks you, you live on, they can be life damaging or life enhancing regarding an individual or a population's health. That's why it's important to characterize the types of deserts by the social determinants of health, because once again, it can be life damaging or life enhancing because everyone has them. So to reiterate what makes our study different from all the other studies is how we define the desert. So we use that criteria of one mile or greater away from a community pharmacy to identify all of the deserts in LA County. And then we use those social determinants of health um, population indicators to explicitly characterize the types of deserts in LA County. Thus, the desert types are conceptualized in the Healthy People 2020, 2030 Social Determinants of Health Framework. Next slide, please. So the um, population level data that we use to approximate or represent those social determinants of health indicators included the ACS data from the American Community Survey from 2000, from 2010, um, federal poverty level, household ownership, um, vehicle ownership, education attainment, the language spoken at home, health insurance status. And then we have some census data looking at race, ethnicity, and age, and then crime data looking at crime within those census tracts or those communities um, against people and property. And then some of the um, health resources and services administrative data looking at health professional shortage areas. 
So in regards to our analysis, we extracted the community pharmacy, so only community pharmacies, not ambulatory clinic type pharmacies from the California Board of um, the California Board of Pharmacy Licensee Database and geocoded them to, and then from the street network distances, we calculated um, how far it was from the census, census track centroid to the nearest pharmacy. Once again, that community pharmacy. And the pharmacy deserts were, again, defined as being um, more than one mile in that road network traveling distance. And what we did, we use a K-means clustering analysis to um, partition the pharmacy deserts into different types um, based on their composition and typology. And we map these results with um, GIS. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what did we find? Um, what did we learn about pharmacy deserts and non-deserts in LA County? So just a little tidbit about LA County, it's divided into eight geographical service planning areas. Um, and this is done by the Department of Public Health for planning and implementing um, public health and clinical programs based on the needs of each area. Um, this table just displays that distribution of pharmacy deserts and non-deserts in Los Angeles County by those spas or the service planning areas. Of the 2,300 and 23 census tracts in LA County, we found that 571 of them were pharmacy deserts based on our definition, and um, 1,752 were non-deserts. Um, interestingly, San Fernando, which is spa two, had the largest population and number of pharmacy deserts and non-deserts overall, which is not surprising because of the large population. And on the other hand, the West Spa um, had the least number of pharmacy deserts and the second smallest population overall. This is also not surprising, but then it speaks to um, how exclusive those communities are that make up those service planning areas. Next slide, please. So upon further analysis, looking at the desert types, um, two distinct types of deserts were um, identified by clustering those social determinants of health population indicators. Type one deserts, um, there were about 238 of those census tracts that were considered type one. And then type two deserts, there were about 333 census tracts that were considered type two. So in comparison to type two desert residents, type one desert residents live in areas um, that potentially could compound the negative effect of having that shortage of a phar pharmacy near them or those pharmacy services. So that distance being greater than one mile. Um, in type one deserts, they contain denser populations. So when you think about the residents per square mile is def definitely denser in those communities, more non-Hispanic black, more Hispanic, more renters, more that speak English as their second language. So there could be some linguistic isolation. Um, less vehicle ownership, more we're living under the federal poverty level, um, more we're living in areas um, with higher crime against property and people, and they had less health professionals to serve the area and less had health insurance. So in comparison to that with type two, you have type two desert residents. They live in areas with um, less of the residents lack health insurance. Um, there's a less dense population overall in regards to residents per square mile, um, less less non-Hispanic Black, um, less Hispanic, less renters, or those that speak English as a second language, less we're living below the federal, federal poverty level, and less living in areas with um, crimes against people and property and more health care professionals to serve the area. So this just demonstrates a key point that there's an inequitable distribution of those social determinants of health within the pharmacy deserts. And it's this same inequitable distribution of those social determinants of health, that is the driver of um, the health disparities that we see, whether they're along the racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic dimension. Next slide. So just to zoom in just a little closer, um, I, um, as stated earlier, Los Angeles County is divided into those eight geographical service plan areas. So just taking a a closer look at a tail between these two service planning areas who are right next to each other. Um, so we have spa five and spa six. So here we have the notable communities. So notable communities in spa five include your Beverly Hills, Malibu, Venice, Santa Monica, places known for affluence. And then in regards to spa six, you have Compton, Watts, Athens, and Crenshaw, um, areas with high numbers of racial ethnic minorities um, living there. In regards to the pharmacy desert types that you found in each, you found that there, we found that there were um, zero type one deserts in um, spa five, whereas all 100% of them were um, type two. However, 
um, you have 54 type one deserts in spa six, whereas there's only four type two in spa six. Um, in regards to the geography, there's urban and suburban um, mixtures between both. Um, one thing that was striking, there were 1.22 pharmacies per 1,000 residents in SPA 5, um, um, but there are only 0.26 pharmacies um, per 1,000 residents in SPA 6. So in terms of magnitude, there are almost five times as many pharmacies per 1,000 residents in SPA 5 than there are in SPA 6. And then you see that in regards to um, residents per square mile, about 3,300 residents per square mile in SPA 5, wh while there are um, 14,000 residents per square mile in SPA 6. Um, so, and then in regards to that racial ethnic makeup, you have um, it's majority non-Hispanic white in SPA 5, but um, SPA 6 is majority Hispanic and non-Hispanic black. Um, in regards to what, um, just in regards to what this may mean, so the impact. So all the pharmacy deserts are type two in SPA 5, but this, our data shows that that these residents are lacking access to community pharmacy based on that travel distance. However, when you think about it, more of the residents in this area have vehicles. They have, um, they're living in suburban areas where the pharmacy might be spread out geospatially by the design, um, more have health insurance coverage, and there's more healthcare professionals to serve the area. So that access to the pharmacy um, just by the distance may not be burdensome, but on the flip side, if in SPA 6, you have um, residents who don't have vehicles. They live in areas where um, crime is higher. Um, they lack health insurance, um, may not speak English as their first language and less health professionals to serve the area. So all of these aspects contribute to what I call that distance traveled um, and impose barriers to getting to a pharmacy. Next slide. So this is just showing on the map the different service planning areas um, by those demarcated by those borders. In the red, we have the West Spa, and then in blue, we have Spa 6. Um, so what we need to consider is that from the historical perspective, prior to that civil rights movement, we had discriminatory practices such as redlining, um, which contain um, people of color in impoverished and densely populated neighborhoods, while you had um, non-Hispanic whites out migrating to suburban areas such as those seen in spot five and while this no longer exists there's no redlining um, there's been a series of race riots economic forces that have um, increased housing costs and immigration that all contribute to the persistence of that predominantly minority communities that we see in um, los angeles more specifically as seen here you have spot six which is 68 percent um, latinx and 27 percent black and then you have um, spot five which is um, 64% non-Hispanic white. And I just want you to note how spatially, how big West, the Western spot is com compared to the South spa. Next slide. So just to wrap everything home, up, the um, take home points um, for this conclusion is that the causes of this divergent and inequitable distribution of social determinants of health factors in these type one and type two pharmacy deserts definitely have his historical formation and structural inequity, which contributes to that population migration in Los Angeles County. Um, there are definitely market forces that play a role in the formation of pharmacy deserts, such as closures and um, different competition for market share, but that's not the point of this presentation. Um, there's a need for a more in-depth analysis of the population health um, implications and consequences. So residents in these different service planning areas might benefit greatly from equitable, innovative community-based interventions that increase access to medications, pharmacy services, and pharmacists. Okay. All right, next slide. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, and these are just my acknowledgments. Um, so they take they say it takes a village. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, Dr. Paul Robinson, who's the health geographer and senior author on this work, and several programs at CDU. Um, my fellowship program, CRCD, the Access Program, the Urban Health Institute, and of course my community mentor. Um, with all of them, without without their support, this presentation and project would not have been possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wizard. That was wonderful. Um, I do see that there are questions coming popping up with the chat, but later on we do have a time where we can get together and talk 
you know, in the, in the larger room so we can address some of those questions later on. I just want to make sure that we finish all the case studies that we have. Um, so our next speaker, who's going to give us another perspective on health diversity is Dr. Carrie Hurley Kim. Um, Dr. Hurley Kim is also a health sciences assistant clinical professor at UCI School of Pharmacy. She's going to be talking about something different. She's going to talk about vaccinations, specifically COVID-19 vaccinations in Los Angeles, California, and the case study of vaccination rate disparities. So let's welcome Dr. Hurley Kim. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan. Um, so yeah, uh, following right along with Dr. West's presentation, we're going to um, stay in LA County, um, but this time talking about um, vaccination rate disparities and specifically in terms of um, COVID-19. Um, so in addition to my work at UCI, I also um, co-chair the um, steering committee for the Immunization Coalition of LA County. So a lot of these things are derived from um, some work group and other experiences um, through the vaccination effort in Los Angeles County. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit more background of, on Los Angeles County, and I think we talked about some of these things already, but our population is right around 10 million. Um, so we are the largest by population county in the United States, um, and of course, home to the second largest city in the United States. Um, Notably for this material, we are a majority minority county, meaning that um, a minority of our population is non-Hispanic white. Um, in addition, of a large proportion of the residents of LA County are not US born. Um, and we do have 14 current um, threshold languages. So these are languages that a large, a large proportion, about 5% uh, or greater of the population speak as their primary language. So um, a, a large um, racial, ethnic, um, cultural diversity in, in Los Angeles County. In addition, um, a lot of um, economic disparity. So 13.4% poverty rate, and you can see the chart there, um, the differences in median household income based on racial and ethnic groups. So you can see a large disparity, um, particularly with um, our black and Hispanic neighbors. Uh, next slide, please. So COVID-19 in Los Angeles um, follows you know, a, a similar story, but a little bit um, more intensive <laughs> with, uh, we had a, a really significant uh, wave of cases through the late fall and uh, early winter of 2020, 2021. Um, we have so far had over 1.24 million cases and more than 24,000 deaths just in Los Angeles County. Um, we have come a long way. So our recent seven day average, um, only uh, 221 cases per day and only seven deaths per day. Um, and this is not to minimize, you know, even those lower numbers of deaths are still significant, um, but we've, we've come a long way since that peak in early January. Um, next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, though, just looking at those raw numbers does not tell us the whole story of COVID. Um, and this is true whether you're looking at Los Angeles, Los Angeles County, um, California, the United States, um, even globally. So um, areas where we see large clusters of cases, um, cumulative cases. So um, and you probably will recognize <laughs> some of these from Dr. Wiss's presentation. So um, South LA um, was probably the most hard hit. Um, area of Los Angeles County when it comes to COVID cases. And this is the neighborhoods where, you know, you're hearing stories of entire families um, being infected and sometimes, you know, multiple generations um, having COVID related fatalities. Um, so you can see there is not an even distribution of COVID cases in Los Angeles by any means. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of our vaccinations for Los Angeles County, so we've made a lot of progress, of course. Um, our vaccination data is a little bit, um, lags a little bit behind our case data um, because of some of the reporting um, processes, but um, so far we've administered um, getting close to 10 million doses in LA County. Um, we have about 62% of our um, uh, adult and you know, uh, uh, older adolescent population vaccinated. Um, there's a little bit of uh, cross-pollination with some of our neighboring counties when we look at these numbers because some people who, for example, live in Orange County may have received their vaccine in LA County and vice versa. 
Um, so there's a little um, difference in the way that those are reported. Um, we also have a really high uh, rate of seniors being vaccinated, so close to 84% having received at least one dose. Next slide, please. Um, but again, if we just look at the, you know, the raw numbers, it doesn't tell us the whole story. So we do have um, persistent and significant uh, disparities in the rates of vaccination, particularly with uh, our Black, African American, and Latinx populations in LA County. You can see them um, struggling far behind our, uh, especially our Asian and white um, population. And this is true both of our um, 16 plus population as a whole, and also as our 65 plus population um, separately. Next slide, please. Um, so this just shows um, a, you know, similar mapping for vaccination rates in the county. And you can see um, some of those areas. So the lighter or brown colors are lower vaccination rates, where the darker uh, greener colors are higher vaccination rates. Um, so we have, you know, kind of uh, overcome our main peak of vaccine administration. And I think this is something that um, was expected. You know, we, we reached a lot of people very quickly, but we're getting to the point where, you know, um, the people who have uh, the ability and the resources to access a mass vaccination site, they have done so. Um, so we've kind of moved on to a next phase where, it, you know, we're, it's going to take considerably more resources and effort to reach additional um, numbers of people for vaccination. So we have kind of shifted and that's why you see that, that pretty significant drop off um, since early April in terms of uh, weekly vaccinations. Next slide, please. But I did also wanna just kind of point out the discrepancy here where you're seeing communities with the highest impact from COVID are the exact same communities that have the lowest vaccination rates. Um, and I think this is true for a variety of reasons. I think access is a big part of it. I think hesitancy for a number of reasons is also a big part of it. Um, but I think it really points out the imperative that we have to focus very heavily on these communities that need um, additional resources, um, additional access to vaccination because they are the ones who have suffered the most from this pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So circling then back to our uh, pharmacist roles, and I will say that um, I, I don't think I've had a prouder moment as a pharmacist than you know, working in some of these max vaccination sites, whether it was at UCI, um, vaccinating patients at the clinic where I work, um, and seeing you know, pharmacists really um, covering every role. So you know, we have been involved with the public health and planning. Um, we have covered essentially, you know, every inch of what we're calling that last mile from distribution until the shot in the arm. And this is true at pharmacies, at our mass vaccination sites, at um, clinics, hospitals, um, and uh, assisted living. Um, I think there are not other professionals who are able to follow a vaccine all the way from, um, you know, uh, distribution, storage, dose preparation, patient education and actual vaccine administration and even um, the management of side effects. So pharmacists are the only ones, maybe we don't, aren't the only ones with that, the, you know, the legal authority to do those things, but I have not seen a physician administer a vaccine. I have not seen, you know, a nurse be involved with vaccine storage. So um, while I think our um, interprofessional collaboration is extraordinarily important, I think pharmacists have been, um, you know, kind of the leaders uh, through this, through a lot of this process. Um, and in LA County, we've also been able to be involved with um, what we're kind of calling our hyper-local uh, vaccine expertise and administration, where we have found that people respond um, much more positively to the expertise of someone who lives in their neighborhood, who they regularly get their prescriptions from or see for their regular medical care compared to, you know, a nationally recognized expert at Cedar sinai or UCLA. So, um, I think pharmacists have done a, a lot in terms of um, promoting vaccinations in LA County. Next slide, please. But unfortunately, um, I, I think what Dr. Wiss's study points out is that, you know, we are an answer, but we are not the whole answer. So um, there's a lot of um, reliance, I think, on pharmacists and pharmacies to be the ones to now vaccinate in communities who 
uh, maybe didn't have access or didn't have, um, you know, had concerns with a large government run mass vaccination site. But those are also the same communities that may not have the same access to a pharmacist that um, a, a lot of the communities who already have received their vaccinations do. So you can see, you know, essentially a mirror image again, where the, the communities that were hardest hit have the lowest vaccination rates now may also not have the same access to a pharmacist. So I think this is a really important piece of information for public health to be able to give additional resources for vaccinating in some of these communities. Next slide, please. And then I did just wanna to touch very quickly um, on some vaccine disparities that go outside of COVID-19. Um, this is certainly not the first time, um, this is not something that's you know, new or unique to COVID vaccinations by any means. Um, this is some uh, national data now, and um, this is from 2017, um, looking at uh, changes in um, disparities. And you can see you know, historic disparities in Black, non-Hispanic, and also our Hispanic population. And also in for some of these vaccines, those disparities are continuing to get worse, not better. Um, and I did want to particularly point out the pneumococcal vaccination um, to show that for our over 65 population, where this is a routine vaccine, we do see a persistent disparity. Um, however, there's not that same, um, well, there's not that same initial optic when we look at our younger patients, but I think the explanation for this is that the indications for pneumococcal vaccinations in our younger population are those that tend to affect minority communities more. So things like smoking, asthma, um, that we know have higher uh, incidence in, especially in our black population. So while this may look like a, a lack of disparity in this one area, I think the, it's really just um, a, a mirror image of another different disparity. Uh, next slide, please. And we've actually seen um, something very similar in some research that we are currently working on in a, a research group here at UCI with um, Dr. Chan and Dr. Wissa both involved here. Um, and these numbers are a little different. These are not um, straight vaccination rates like on the previous slide. So these are percentages of a cohort who have um, who fall into either of these racial or ethnic groups. Um, but we can see again, um, significant underrepresentation, especially in our black and Hispanic um, populations in each of our vaccination cohorts, with the exception of that, um, that pneumococcal uh, younger age group where we actually see a statistical over representation, but um, again, I, and I, we haven't run specific numbers to find out whether this is, you know, definitely the case, but I, I really strongly suspect that it's because these patients have much higher um, risk and uh, incidence for indications for this vaccine. Next slide, please. And that is all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hurley Kim. Okay, um, moving along to our next speaker, um, and we're very honored to have someone from um, Howard University College of Pharmacy, um, Jaquise Unou. Um, she'll be talking to us about medication education disparities, um, and specifically on how to increase patient touch points in order to improve patient care. And I think this is important because ultimately we wanna make sure that our patients are able to use the meds correctly and achieve the best outcome. So all yours, Jaquise, thank you again for speaking to us today. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Dr. Chan, for inviting me. I'm very excited to be a part of this. And um, the presentations that have been brought forward thus far have been very interesting and very uh, timely. So I'm glad to be here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just a reiterate what Dr. Chan said. Um, I am at Howard University College of Pharmacy and I'm actually a community pharmacy faculty, um, clinical assistant professor, and I've been in community pharmacy practice for a while in um, the ambulatory care space. 
So what I want to do in the next 10 minutes is take you along with me on this journey with my um, one of my favorite patients, Miss Betty, who's actually a representation of a lot of the patients that I see with regards to disparities in education. Um, and she's an, a Hispanic female, but it also applies to a, a lot of my African American patients as well, but just the lack of education and the lack of um, being provided education on like a continuous basis, I think is, um, is a big issue. So I will go through defining patient touch points if you've never heard of it before, um, and then also presenting the case and kind of highlighting the literature that surrounds the touch points. And then also um, presenting some recommendations for increasing those touch points with your patients. Next slide, please. So what is a touch, a touch point? And really, if you kind of research touch points, the first thing that you probably will see is it more related to business and more of marketing. So like how often do you touch base with your customer? But it's actually something that is really uh, usable with in medicine and healthcare. And so when we think about it, it's the, any kind of contact or a contact spot between a patient and a provider. And this can be in many settings. It can be in the hospital, retail, urgent care, ambulatory care, any kind of um, extra COVID-19 clinics that we set up being uh, in this pandemic. Anytime that you've come in contact with a patient is considered a patient touch point. And it really impacts the patient's overall experience with, uh, with healthcare and with the healthcare team. So how satisfied is that patient with you and with the healthcare team based on those touch points that you've provided with the patient? Next slide. And so when, before I start talking about Miss Betty, I actually wanna talk about uh, or continue to expand on the touch point and what that actually means. I think that um, the touch points that we think about as pharmacists are, okay, if you're in the hospital and you work in um, your staff pharmacist, maybe when you go into the patient's room, if that's your role, that may be one touch point. Or if you're in community pharmacy, when you see that patient come in to pick up a prescription, or if you're trying to provide counseling for that patient or provide an MTM service, that's a touch point, but it actually includes a lot of other things that may be aside from being face-to-face. What we try to do is you're trying to get that patient to really, really have a connection with you, right? You're trying to build that connection with the patient. So they're constantly thinking, I have this person or these people in my corner. And so with Mrs. Betty, she's a Hispanic female in her late 50s. Uh, when I initially met her, she uh, was already coming to the pharmacy. I'm there in, a, like I said, an ambulatory care capacity, but she had her person. Right. And as, as you know, with a lot of our minority people, they have their person who they feel comfortable with. And that actually tends to be the person that they talk to all the time, even though there may be other people, as in this example, pharmacists that actually should have been talking to her more. Right. So her person was actually not even a pharmacy technician, but more of a staff member that was doing a, you know, a different job. But because she spoke Spanish, she talked to her all the time. Okay, so it's there, um, her health disparity included um, a language, um, I wouldn't say a language barrier, which I didn't put that because she did speak some English, but I think that that was a part of it too. But she had multiple conditions, so diabetes, asthma, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, chronic kidney disease. So basically a picture that we see very, very often with our patients. But because she had that connection with that person, that was the person that mainly saw her other than her pick, picking up the medications. But when I met her, I saw that she had all these con different conditions and I like to, um, to speak my little bit of Spanish when I can. Um, so I used to talk to her all the time when she came in. And so we developed a rapport and she used to talk to me more and more. And then when I found out that she um, also goes to a provider that I'm familiar with, uh, with regards to her diabetes, then I used to follow up with her even more. So I started to establish a rapport with her before I even started going through the MTM sessions, right? So she began to get familiar with me. So then um, I said, well, won't you come on um, and meet with me in the pharmacy, say next week, because she also lived close to the pharmacy. And she said, yes. So she was very happy. And then of course, because she's in her late fifties, um, it was also another person to talk to. Right, so it was just her and her husband. And so she came in and um, I met with her and I was able to get some information with her regard, with regards to different labs and things and go over her profile. And then I noticed that she had um, a couple of different 
monitors with her with regards to the diabetes. And that's what I highlighted on here because that was her biggest issue, right? And so she um, told me that she, you know, always took her medication. She takes them as they as she's supposed to, and actually had my students reach out to her physician. And we also talked to the physician as well. And the physician also said that she takes them. She said that she takes them as she's supposed to. And as I find with a lot of my um, minority patients, is you really have to ask the question twenty times to really get um, a good answer. So sometimes it stays the same for the first maybe three or four times, and then after that it starts to adjust or change a little bit and you get more information and more information even as your relationship develops. So um, with regards to this first barrier, education, she is someone who uh, finished early, again, like mid um, middle school, that's her highest education, which I would say was probably 90% of my patients, okay? And then um, also with the stigma um, with regards to diabetes. So I would say on my fourth um, encounter with her, I actually did a house call. So I like to try to get more and more um, in touch with them. So I did a house call because she, like I said, was close by. And when I came, she actually had a cheese and cracker platter ready and some drinks and things because um, she was ready for the visit and she was very excited. So we sat down and the same questions that I had been asking her previously, I asked them again in different ways, right? And my students were actually with me. So I had two students. Um, and so they, um, when we asked her about her um, medications, we wanted her just take me through your day. You know, what do you do? What do you like to do for fun? And so she started telling us about um, the center that she goes to. I said, what do you do at this center? Um, what do your friends do? What do you like to do? We do this. How often do you go? I go this many days a week. That's awesome. So when you're there, what do you do with your insulin pen? She was like, um, well, you know what? I really don't want my friends to know that I'm doing that. So whenever I go to the center, I just usually don't take my insulin. It's like, there you go. So the provider really couldn't figure out why um, her numbers were like they were when she's supposed to be taking them every day, as said, right? And they also actually updated her regimen. So um, education, uh, going back to education, I also noticed that sometimes her bottles are in Spanish, sometimes they're back in English. Her um, pill box sometimes is in Spanish, sometimes is back in English. And that's not something that's is like done intentionally, but I think with, uh, with regards to the health disparities and these things that we're watching out for, um, it's just something that you have to just, it's just specific detail to pay attention because it's automatic to put it in English, right? And you're not even thinking about it. Um, but the stigma also with the communities, so she doesn't, she didn't want them to see um, them injecting herself or know that she's taking insulin. Right. And then the next one is wanted to please the providers. So I'm wondering why the provider didn't know that she had these issues, because whenever the provider asked her questions, she wants to tell the provider what she's thinking is expecting to hear. It's almost like a parent relationship. Right. So I don't want to disappoint the provider. And I'm sure the provider didn't have time to speak with her as much as I do and to get on that level with them to develop the relationship and the rapport. So wanting to please the providers, again, um, I'm using her as a, as a case scenario, but the majority of my patients have that same issue. Um, uh, I would say another patient, um, not Miss Betty, but again, with regards to hypertension, he didn't want his provider to know that he couldn't read. So for seven years before I got there, um, they've been doing different things and trying different things, but didn't know that all that whole time that he couldn't read, right? So I think that these three barriers that are pointing out, I put them on here because this is what I see a majority of the time. And with regards to the, to the disparities, things that um, we as pharmacists really are good at paying attention to and really getting into um, as opposed to other providers, not to knock anyone else, but we tend to have a little bit more time to try to, um, to ask these extra questions. So the result was her hemoglobin A1C went from 11.3% down to 7.4% um, over that time period, which was about eight to 10 months um, after really getting to know her and doing the house calls and her coming in. And so what I wanna tie in is, go to the next slide, please. 
we're talking about these touch points. So um, Calendrian um, et al, they wrote an article um, talking about these touch points and really being in contact with your patients, trying to be in contact with them at least seven times out of the 12 months of the year. And this seven times does not mean just like I said, in person, but this can be newsletters, phone call check-ins, emails, um, things that you want to, uh, you know, to make sure that they've understood from your last visit, it could be anything. And it also does not have to be with one provider. So that's why on the this side with the first bullet was the key, I'm saying multiple touch points by multiple providers. So this seven out of 12 doesn't need to just be from their physician. That includes me as a pharmacist being a part of the healthcare team and really interacting with that patient. So even though I saw Miss Betty maybe two or three weeks ago, and I don't necessarily need to, you know, do anything with her, I do, I have her schedule in my computer system as a phone call check-in, just to follow up, because she's really not seeing her physician for another two months, right? And what I tend to see is uh, between the times that they follow up with their physician, they were supposed to do something that they didn't understand. So for the whole two months, when it's time to, you know, see the physician again, they just weren't doing anything. So in talking to the second provider, which would be us, and having that other touch point, we're able to fix whatever it is and also communicate with the provider if needed to adjust something so that they can see the true picture of what the action plan was prior to that next visit. And then also provides um, consistent engagement. So in this article, I talked about the more times that you touch the patient and with these providers touching the patient, you're more likely to increase the loyalty of the patient then really understanding what you're, you're talking about, um, improving the education of the patient and then um, being, them being more satisfied. And that patient satisfaction is tied to better treatment adherence and then also improvement in the outcomes that you're reaching or that you're searching for, okay? Um, and like I said, those seven interactions, if we think of the patients that we have, maybe um, they're difficult patients, then we're thinking, oh, I, I definitely see that patient or talk to that patient more than seven times a year, right? So this is just still a basis, but I think that um, if you're thinking about the provider along with myself and how many times we contact the patient, but just still making sure that we have um, a handout for those patients, especially the ones that get lost. So we have patients that get lost, like maybe you were supposed to see them more often, but because they've kind of slipped through and we weren't able to reach them and then you forget about them, now two or three months have passed and now you really do fall into, well, did I really um, touch them seven times out of the 12 months because they were lost to follow up, okay? So having a great rapport with the patient, um, the interactions don't consist of just going through the motions are you really, really looking into what could be going on with this patient, kind of going through the social determinants of health, financially, what are they going through? Are they going through things with their daughters? This patient actually um, told me that after their visit with the physician, okay, I'm following up on this. I know their physician in the notes said that this is what they were going to follow up on next time. So how was it? He said, yeah, I told him this and this and that, but I really didn't do any of the things that I told him because I just didn't feel comfortable and he would be mad, right? So really making sure that they understand that we're part of a team. You know, I, I wanna know what, you're, what you're, you think that you're capable of doing and we can adjust to that and gradually change things as we go. It's not more like an iron fist. This is what you should be doing. You didn't do it, why didn't you do that? Okay, so trust, 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 extremely important. And then more time to talk, which I put in parentheses, I know, this is a difficult one, but more time to talk, which I know was a big part with Miss Betty with the talking, because that's how I got to the point of oh, what exactly are you doing it with this, um, you know, the older person center where you end up not taking your medicine three to four days out of the week. Otherwise, I would have never known that. Next slide. So in conclusion, increasing touch points with patients um, provides consistent engagement. Um, we find out really their uh, education level as we talk to them more, they get more comfortable with us. We see what it is that they really need and what we need to do to meet them where they are. 
Positive engagement with continuous opportunities for check-in and education is also key for successful outcomes. So like I said, patient satisfaction increases treatment adherence. They feel comfortable, they're loyal. As you can see in the, you'll see in the article, um, more touch points, more loyalty includes um, or makes the, uh, gives room for improvement for them to be more comfortable with you and to kind of actually work with you on what the goals are. And they have an understanding of what the goals are and feel like you're working as a team. So that's all right. And I think that's it. So that was just a quick journey with one of my patients um, that I feel like when I was thinking about it just really covers a large majority of the patients that I talk to and that I end up um, helping. Definitely will not doing the house calls during the COVID, but more of a telemedicine type scenario. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great talk and I really learned a lot from, from you know, your sharing really. Um, so now we are coming to uh, an hour into um, our webinar. Um, I do want us to break out into small groups and um, our staff will be helping out to break us all into three groups. And um, I'm gonna keep this a little bit shorter since you know, we're already going into one hour of the webinar. We'll, keep the, we'll, we'll break out for about 15 minutes. And the goal for the breakout is for us to Let's you know, you know, come together and think about the things that we've learned from the three cases, um, and think about how can we really utilize the information that we learned, and think about how do we, you know, engage the community to reduce health disparity. Now, this is a very broad type of question that we're really asking here, um, and again, depending on the scenario, depending on where you practice, depending on you know what you have observed, you know, at your practice site. You know, there might be certain things that you see that, that are very effective for addressing some of these issues that our speakers have brought up earlier, ranging from, you know, you know distance to a pharmacy or even like the, the utilize of vaccines or me medication education. But, you know, what I wanted everyone to, to think about is what are some challenges that you really have faced when it comes to health disparity in your own practice? And if you're not practicing, maybe from what you hear from your colleagues, and how did you or your colleagues overcome these challenges, you know, when it comes to health disparity? So um, for each of the room, we'll have somebody who's going to be, you know, assigned to do the scribing. We already have a faculty or staff who's assigned to do so, uh, to scribe and also to come back to the larger room to share in 15 minutes time. So um, are we ready to go into the breakout rooms? I ready. Here you go. All right. I'll see you guys in 15. All right. Um, I hope you all had a very good discussion within the <coughs> 15 minutes. I know it's very short. Okay, so um, I think what we can do is um, I'm gonna have everyone, we have a representative from each group to do the, the, the scribing and the sharing. So maybe I'll have everyone from each of the breakout groups to discuss. So from group one, I have Aya. Yeah. I would you like to share with everyone of some findings that you you that we things that we have discussed in our small group. Okay, so we our group were talking about the communication first. So um, so seven uh, 12 out of seven like touch point. How often we need to talk to the patient? Sometimes we notice that the patient feels like too much contacting from us. Like every time I'll call and some patient doesn't want to receive that much call or like you no know, visitings and those others. So the communication is not only that uh, call or visiting, but we can send emails or some newsletters or like, you know, drug adverse reaction, those type of information might be needed. And also, but at the same time, some of the patients who are elderly who are so lonely, then they want to talk a lot, but don't during the talk, like we can discuss more other things. And then also we can communicate with um, their family member as well so that um, we can double check what they're taking or we can make sure that they have another appointment. So the communication is the key. That's what we're, we've been talking. And then also when it comes to the disparity and also the cost of the medication, um, some of the reality is we need to talk with the patient, um, the, 
uh, the cost of the medication is too expensive for them and what other option they can take. Because that's the reality that some of the medication is better with the outcome, but they are not afford of those medications. Then how we can communicate with that? And maybe we can discuss other options and other people are taking maybe other medication and maybe doing good, but still like we had a hard time um, communicating with them. And the patient also always want to um, compare with why other people are taking that medication, why not me and what is the outcome? So those are the things that um, so uh, we couldn't solve or maybe we can discuss more. Um, any other things, Dr. Jen? Good talk. No, I think you've covered quite a bit from our group. Um, Jaquiz and Lee, anything else that we discussed that you think that it's worth to share? Okay, why don't we have the other groups to share and then we can, we can circle back. Um, group two, we have Christine to help us to share the findings. Yeah, in our group, we had um, Carrie Hurley Kim, Ryan Bowler, and then MB. MB, what was your last name? <laughs> Doc, Dr. MB. Drami. Yes. <laughs> She's also from Howard University. We had a really great discussion about some challenges that we've all faced when it comes to health disparities in our practices. And, you know, a lot of what comes up is things we've heard before, things like basic health literacy, socioeconomic barriers, insurance issues that that pose you know, barriers to access to medications, language barriers, things like limitations when interpreter services aren't available. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, a big issue that we talked about for a long time was an issue of trust, especially when it comes to stigmatized conditions um, or even with chronic disease state management. And then even with things like mass vaccination clinics for COVID-19, patients may not trust a mass vaccination clinic that's government run as opposed to going to a clinic or provider that they've already established rapport with and established a relationship built on trust for. I think a lot of it goes back to, you know, we talked about what Jacquees mentioned in her talk about touch points. It does take time to develop this relationship with patients where they trust you as a provider, because, but in order to get there, many times you need multiple touch points to get to that um, I think we also mentioned that historically we talk about us as provider or pharmacists being the most accessible providers, mm -hmm. but are we the most accessible providers to everyone across the board? Or as we've heard from other, from speakers here today, even is there some inequity or disparities in the accessibility to pharmacists as well as underutilization of pharmacists because of a lack of education about what the role we play as providers is and the training and the depth of knowledge and the things and the types of services we can provide. So based on all of those discussions, our group has, you know, I think we just initiated this discussion, but we've talked about the importance of us as pharmacists engaging the community by actually reaching our communities. So we can't just you know, be the providers with this wealth of knowledge. We have to somehow reach our communities. And to do so, we may have to do things like bring services to the communities where there is a lack of services. Um, and Imbi, you mentioned things like bringing HCV testing out into the community to the patients in methadone clinics rather than you know, waiting for them to come <laughs> to us. Um, and Carrie mentioned you know, pop-up vaccination clinics in targeted areas versus relying on patients, you know, coming to mass vaccination sites. And then Ryan talked about, you know, the need to have special follow-up with patients that kind of goes back to those extra touch points too, to help address challenges such as um, insurance and access issues. And then MB, Ryan and Carrie, is there anything else that you wanted to add? I think you really captured what we, what yeah. we had talked about. You did. Awesome. Okay, um, group three. Group three, I think we have Erin to help out with describing and sharing. So I will apologize in advance. I don't think I can give quite as um, 
comprehensive of an overview as Christine just set the standard for. Uh, we had some really great discussion in our small group, which was attended by um, Ebony, myself, Jimmy, and Cheryl. So the conversation started by discussing our practice sites and how some of this could be applied, um, how we could utilize this. And really the first issue that we discussed was this concept of vaccine hesitancy and how it puts the onus and the burden on an individual to justify why they're not getting a vaccine when realistically there should be some pre-existing knowledge that these are populations that are historically underserved as evident by the information presented by our speakers today, um, that the concept of hesitancy kind of dismisses some of the population and underrepresented and underserved population dynamics that could have been anticipated. And perhaps there was a bit of a failure on our part in anticipating that and rolling out vaccine sites um, from the get-go, which is putting us in the, the situation that perhaps we're in at the moment. We had discussions about structural competency, some of the social, political, and religious impacts of the underserved and um, underrepresented populations. So we had conversations about how this could be addressed. And one of the primary issues was for education. And UCI School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences is really in a unique position to start educating the next generation of healthcare providers, particularly pharmacists, and to look at some of the history and policy and how that has impacted some of the um, issues that we're seeing now. For example, looking at data on asthma was discussed and how we counsel on using meter dose inhalers when per, you know, possibly we should be looking at things like the impact of the asthma um, diagnosis and what those populations are exposed to being adjacent to freeways and highways, for example. I think we looked at um, some topics about collaborating with other disciplines. And what I took away from this was that, you know, historically pharmacists collaborate with nurses and physicians and possibly, you know, PhDs and some of the more hard sciences. But really, we should be looking at some of the more social sciences to look at population health. We should be collaborating with anthropologists, with policymakers, with lawmakers to ensure that the things that we want to see as change can actually be implemented um, beyond just doing one on one patient counseling, although that's certainly incredibly useful and important that looking at some of the core issues and how pharmacists can collaborate with our colleagues in these other disciplines could really impact significant change. And if any of my group members would like to add to that, I, I welcome them to add to that conversation. Yeah, uh, just a real quick clarification, not to dismiss religious, but it's social, political, and economic structures. But yes, religious can be a portion of it, depending on the individual and their, their beliefs. But that was it. And I guess I just wanted to add to that, and it should not only be for our students, it should be for ourselves too, as um, educators, so that as we're preparing our students, that is something we ourselves are equipped to, you know, learn more about, because we all know we've had a pharmacy um, instructor who had, you know, I wouldn't say undo, but they've had influence on us and we have them as mentors. So, you know, being able to also have this type of education, maybe even to pharmacists who have, um, you know, graduated or are practicing new practitioner, whichever level at like, you know, CEs and things to really talk about that as um, for the entire profession, then we can get it more out there. Maybe it won't be, as um, Jimmy said, uh, more shocking and uncomfortable when people know it, if we can, you know, make it something more well-known. I know that's um, something that's difficult across all disciplines in health, so. This is great. I, I love some of the things that, that you guys have shared over the last 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Now, I've, I've taken copious of notes and things that really jumped out to me in terms of potential things, solutions, and things that we can do better from group one is all about communication. Group two was talking about how we should reach out to the wider community. You know, you know, we should be more presentable out there to help out with those, you know, patients in need, the underserved. And of course, group three was talking a lot about education or even reaching out to other professionals. It seems like we have a lot of ingredients on how to, you know, to grow 
you know, successful programs to help, you know, with health disparity or to reduce that. But the real question that I have for all of us to think about is what, what are the challenges to really to implement these things? I mean, it seems that we have all these great ideas, but how come they're not really existing in our community at this time or not enough of that? I would love to hear what other people are thinking about that issue. Yeah, yeah, please, Jimmy, please. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I've been, you know, I've listened to many of these task tours. So I'm actually one on, um, I participate in one every so often at our, at our health system in Riverside County. Um, my thought is, is that unless there's some sort of incentive or some sort of a way to make sure that that individuals are either or institutions are held accountable for implementing certain changes it will not happen so to give you an example um i appreciate the uh the ashp task force on diversity uh equity and inclusion that just came out it was published on the 15th of may it has a, it's a 30 point uh, uh program and in there there are 29 points or 30 points total but 29 nine of them say should and one of them says encourage. So my thing is, is that, you know, I, I understand that it's to put something off forward, but unless there's, and the other thing is, this is racial diversity, equity, and inclusion. Racism was only mentioned twice and one in the introduction and one throughout the entire uh, 30 points. So unless we actually have one incentive to say that you are either going to get money or Money is not going, or money is going to be taken away from you, meaning you will lose accreditation. X, Y, Z is going to happen because unless there's some some sort of retribution, if you will, or some sort of um, accountability or requirement, if you will, it will not happen. But um, if we follow what's going on with how uh, there's an attack on critical race theory or a sixteen nineteen project, for those of you who may or may not know. It's very likely that if these are implemented, there, there likely will be some sort of backlash. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there as a sort of big overall sort of thing. But that's kind of my thought as to how you know things could develop, but the the issues or the resistance we may feel going forward. I see Carrie's hand up. I also see Jaquiz. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to add on to what Jimmy was saying. And I think something that I've learned through this process of this you know, working with this vaccination effort is that, you know, we in medicine, we rely a lot on the standard of care and, and what should we be providing to patients. But I think from a social aspect, we probably should move away from that. So for example, you know, we need to identify that, th that it will take more effort and more resources and more time to reach certain populations and to get outcomes in certain populations. And you can't just provide the same level of care, the same number of touch points, um, the same type of communication in, you know, a, a wealthy white community that you need to provide in um, a minority or underserved community. And I think with vaccinations that has, you know, made that very apparent, but it, it definitely applies to other um, aspects of healthcare too. That's a good point. I mean, of course, you know, we rely on a lot of recommendations to decide on how we're going to manage our patients. But I think ultimately there, there are a lot of other social factors as well. And I think we need to be mindful of those. Uh, Jaquise? Yes, um, I agree with both uh, what Jimmy um, and Carrie said, but um, to piggyback on what Jimmy said, totally true. So I, I see the same thing when we we're trying to change from more of a, um, like a fee for service and to actually looking at outcomes with regards to the providers and their patients. Mm -hmm. So kind of just checking the boxes, you're supposed to see this patient, this, whatever it was done, but really their blood pressure has been out of control for the last 10 years. Um, so now if you, if now they're actually being fined, if those patients aren't, you know, doing better or you see some type of outcome improvement in your treatment for the patient. So I definitely agree with Jimmy with, if there isn't something that's there, that's going to be punitive to make someone do something or an incentive with regards to the, you know, the person starting or implementing that to go into the community and have the vaccination thing set up. Like who's going to, who's going to pay for that? Who's going to give the extra personnel for that? You no, know, some people, they don't want to be the ones to try to figure that out or try to 
come up with the funds to do that. They are already short staff, so they don't want to be the ones to do that. But people that are coming in into the pharmacy or coming into whatever mass vaccination clinic that you have, at least we're hitting some of the people, like certain certain percentage of them are minority, so we hit some of them. So you think that that's good enough, but it's not. You're going to have to go to the places where you know are the holes or the gaps in the care with regards to the vaccinations and um, really figure out where those places are. Thank you, Jacquees. Imbi? Hi, uh, I, I'm, you know, I am right up there with Jimmy's energy about this and <laughs> some of the things we, uh, myself and a group of colleagues just wrote a paper where we spoke about a uh, critical race theory um, well, we spoke about the fact that it goes way beyond just us not understanding our patients, um, especially black and brown patients when they enter the healthcare system, they can actually be subject to harms, benign neglect. <laughs> I mean, it, it really runs the gamut uh, of different things that they can experience within the healthcare system. And we have to consider those kinds of things when we talk about injecting something into someone's arm. Um, there's a lot of, of, you know, I am, I'm, I'm a black person, but even when I am working with black patients, um, they are still distrust there's, or, or yeah, distrust. Um, and I think that, you know, it doesn't stem from me personally, but I can relate to it in the sense that, you know, it's stemming from a general lack of trust in the system. And a lot of that does come from some of the experiences that they've had. Um, going to maybe other institutions where they have uh, been spoken to in a certain rate, disregarded, their needs not attended to, their pain not managed. Um, you know, they've been, you know, passed over for um, transplants or, you know, you name it, it runs the gamut. And so in, until we really kind of stop allowing the encourage length type of language and really start moving into this has to happen and this needs to happen, it's critical. For it to happen because it's critical due to the fact that it, it will actually end up saving lives, um, then you know we're we're kind of gonna be stuck in, in a in a in an endless circle of people with like minds always speaking with each other sort of in a vacuum. So you know I think that that's a huge thing. And and then there goes the funding, you know, as well. I know that that's been spoken about. Where does the funding flow? In order to do a lot of these types of programs, we need funding. And we need the funding uh, criteria also to um, be um, created in such a way that those of us who may come from backgrounds that are underrepresented have a way into those types of funding streams. I just sat on another committee um, about NIH and, and some of the ways in which there's a, a gap when it comes to uh, persons from underrepresented backgrounds getting in on the funding and from minority serving institutions getting in on the funding. And um, you know, they're, they're, that's something that needs to be worked on. And we were able to provide some recommendations, but we'll see where that goes. So, um, so there's a lot of different facets that we really have to look at in, in this whole um, effort. Thanks, Mb. Um, Jimmy? Okay. Um, yay, I mirror all that, all of it, 100. <laughs> Um, one uh, one thing that I that I just heard from a task force that I want to bring it up uh, to this group is the idea of the youth or the young. Um, if you look at all social movements regarding uh, racial inequities, they have all been led by young individuals. Whether we're talking about the water protect, uh, protectors at at a standing rock. Um, trying to protect our water, whether you're talking about uh, the Black Power part, or, or Black Panther part, uh, Party, whether you talk about the, um, the Young Lords in Harlem, it was all young individuals. So what we really need to do, if you look at what academic medicine is doing right now, a lot of the, the drive towards change to anti-racist policies is coming from the medical students themselves and the residents. It's not coming from the 40, 50, 60 year old uh, docs who've been doing it for umpteen years. It's coming from the youth. So what I think is important is, and I guarantee if we just ask the students what it is that they want, just like I made, like I brought up to our, our little breakout group, just ask them what they need and let us meet you there. Because if not, then like what uh, 
uh, Dr. Drome just said, you're just gonna keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's just, no, we need, we need young people to get us going. A lot of us are tired. A lot of us have a lot of committees and other stuff that we're doing, but the youth are gonna drive us to, especially the promise land. I mean, they're the ones that, you know, they might be thinking what we, what we think is like, oh, it's not, uh, it's not idealistic. It's like, uh, that don't matter. Because the honest truth is, is that if we don't do something people are going to continuously die. And those who are continuously gonna die are the ones who are continuously exploited, um, oppressed and marginalized. That's a great point. And I think that's probably why as a school that's our charge to make sure that we educate our young minds about the importance of these health inequity issues that we see in the community and we don't address them and you know get the ball rolling it's not going to happen but you're absolutely right i i i think we need to cultivate more people to make sure that these issues are being addressed wow that, that was a lot of really good information really dean hirsch it took me a while to find my hand all right um I have two questions. One, right, right where we were right there, that with the students and us being, all of us being educators, it, it's, it's almost like um, empowering the students to, as Jimmy, you said, to drive us there, it is to lead us there. It is asking them. And I'm, and we, I think, I'm just thinking about us at Irvine, we have a College of Health Sciences, I'm thinking, hmm, we need to get the students together across the um, schools. That's originally what I thought. But I don't, does anybody know if um, any of our national organizations, pharmacy organizations, are, are they tackling this at the student level? Do we know that? I don't know. Hi, Dr. Hirsch. When you say tackling this at the student level, um, um, can you elaborate further, like what specifically? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I'm like Student National Pharmaceutical Association, and serving the underserved is a part of their mission. So I know they've been doing yeah. it past like 40 years. So I mean, they do a lot of outreach in the community and a lot of minority um, underserved communities. So and to get the you know positive view of the pharmacists out there. But is that is that student? effort of I'm, I'm i'm going after um jimmy thing of they'll drive us there they'll lead us there is that student organization those students are they also connected with the other students in the other pharmacy organizations because i'm almost thinking it's like like the ashp i'm thinking ashp we have the 30 points da, 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 da. what is there a student movement there i'm kind of thinking across organizations some may be doing some, I, I just don't know if that really, that's a really interesting point about the youth. Depends on the campus. Dry yeah, up. Depends on the pharmacy campus. I think that um, to piggyback on what Cheryl said, um, the Student National Pharmaceutical Association, which is mm -hmm. kind of the baby organization for NPAA. Right. Um, so those students, a lot of those students are also in multiple organizations. So it's the same students in APHA and SNAFA, mm, and right. um, so they do cross. And, and I think that just me being, I'm, I'm the advisor for the SNAFA organization at Howard. So um, I know that there's been efforts in kind of merging efforts between them, like APHA and SNAFA we specifically work on right. um, to do the efforts because they're very focused on going into the community and to make a larger impact, the thought was, why don't we, like work together and yeah. see what we could do. And so um, also utilizing that uh, communication to work with the larger national organization, like the parent organization to make them be able to go even further. Is that kind of what you were talking about? Yeah, it is. I'm just, I don't, I'm more involved kind of with APHA, so that community side, but, but I'm not that involved anymore with the student organizations. And I just- Yeah, really, yeah. Yeah. They actually do really large, I mean, really large projects and that's um, showcased at the, the annual conferences 
-hmm. and you know write the number of impacted patients and it's like 25,000 50,000 patients so um just like Jimmy said if we had to utilize their energy and their yeah. proactiveness I think that we could really get a lot done which is why um you know through NPHA um, I was thinking that using SNAFA or utilizing SNAFA and their energy to really go out into the community for the COVID clinics, which is what I'm working on now, is mm -hmm. a good idea because they are very active. Cheryl? Yeah. I think um, MB had her hand up first before me, if she wanted I to. I think it's still from the last time. I didn't have anything to say. I was just going to try to embarrass Jaquees a little bit and say, well, she has a national office in NAFA, and so she's heavily involved <laughs> um, on a national level with our students in SNAFA, and they do a lot related to the DEI work and things like that, so. Yep, Cheryl's there too. Hey, Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> and I have board members. <laughs> but um, I think, I kind of, I think I lost my train of thought. If it comes back to me, I'll um, say something. Well, Cheryl, maybe it's time to think about SNAFA at, at our institution. Huh? Oh. Figuring it out, what I was going to say, um, LEAD ABC, that is in the School of Medicine, was actually exactly what Jimmy said. It was the students who are now going on to be um, residents that push that program forward. So I do think that if we do let them... Um, you know, come with that energy, um, they will push um, us forward to that because I just attended um, one of the celebrations for some of the first two scholars out of LEAD ABC. And they were talking about the whole process is how they got um, Dr. Major and Dr. Um, Candace um, Taylor Lucas involved into creating that actual LEAD ABC scholar program. So, um, so I think that's definitely um, something we could consider and collaborate with them on that regard as well for some of the pharmacy students coming in. Great. Well, I hate to cut this short because we are really coming towards the end of the session. Um, it's, it's such a wonderful session. This is the first time that we as a school of pharmacy at UCI are running a webinar on health disparity. And we, we've got some really great input for the last two hours. It's, it's pretty amazing. I wanna thank a lot of people who really have made this session to happen. Acknowledge every one of you who are also here as well to participate. This is certainly not the end. Um, you know, many of you who have been involved today, I'll definitely be in touch with all of you and see how we can come up with, you know, you know, future sessions so that you know we're able to address a larger community. Um, and certainly, you know, want to collaborate with many of you. Hopefully, we'll be able to run some more of these, you know, learning sessions and and work on projects together as well. So I want to thank all of you for really coming today um, and participate. Um, it's wonderful. Um, I know that there were some questions in the chat that came from Jimmy, so I'll make sure that our speakers will get back to you on those, okay? Um, again, because of a short of time. Thank you again, everyone, and I hope everyone will enjoy a great weekend. Um, we'll, we'll be in touch. Nice to meet everybody.